Hey there students, welcome back to Intensive Review. And in this segment, we are going to take a look at American Imperialism, USHC 5.1. Standard 5 deals largely with foreign policy. So we need to understand that traditional American foreign policy prior to 1898, the Spanish-American War, was a policy of non-intervention or what a lot of people would call isolationism. Remember that Jefferson and Washington talked about not entering into entangling alliances to focus on trade and not get involved with the rest of the world to really focus on ourselves. And we were more focused on expanding. We're more focused on manifest destiny throughout most of the 19th century. Now, this is America then, okay? I mean, it's just, yeah, all right, wasn't that big. And Manifest Destiny, eventually we accomplish that. And after Manifest Destiny is accomplished, what next? Because Americans like to grow. Americans are you know, very greedy people, for better or for worse. And in 1867, we purchased Alaska, which this was really the last piece of available land in North America. So, what now? So bored. Sounds like people that have been going through intensive review for two days, huh? So what do we do now? You weren't supposed to respond to that. All right. So we could totally do this. Like, here's the British Empire. It's like the British can do it. Why can't we do it? And so let's contrast American foreign policy in the 19th and the 20th century. The 19th century, you might refer to this as isolationism. Keep in mind that's a loaded term, but it's the term that it seems most likely to show up on your exam. And a policy of neutrality, as Washington would have called it, where we avoid conflicts with other nations whenever possible. And then there's the 20th century, a policy of intervention, where we engage with other nations in order to promote the national interest of the United United States, excuse me. So when we look at motivations for imperialism, there are four that are in your curriculum guide that you'll want to know. First of all, social Darwinism. Now this is sort of an oversimplification. A lot of things in this in this curriculum are, but you know, Europeans did believe that they were, Europeans and Americans believed that their civilizations were superior. And so you're looking at inferior peoples, we're out competing them, yada yada. Survival of the fittest here, okay, where you see that uh, even though we might have said that, okay, we're trying to be benevolent and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, doesn't look like it so much. An expansion of markets. This is a big deal. Keep in mind the Transcontinental Railroad was about creating a national market. This is about creating an international market and expanding even farther out uh, into the world. Crop prices stabilize as a result of imperialism because now we have more places to sell our crops, more markets to send them, and more trade in general. Here is a cartoon that says, here's before U.S. imperialism, and here is after U.S. imperialism. Now, of course, you can see a bit of uh, you know, pro-America bias there. We make it look like everybody's wealthy and all of that kind of stuff. Probably not the case. Now, also, to spread Christianity and Western civilization, that there are a lot of people who were missionaries. A lot of people still are missionaries going to different countries and that sort of thing. So to spread Christianity and Western civilization, y'all might have read the poem before in some class or another, The White Man's Burden, you know, where Rudyard Kipling is encouraging the United States to take up the white man's burden. And then, you know, so you see there the white man's burden carrying these inferior peoples up to the pinnacle of civilization. Naval bases, all right, so uh, you see here, I believe that is the USS South Carolina before it was like scrapped after World War I, if I'm not mistaken, but you know, we've got, we're building a navy at this time, so we need bases. We want to expand as a naval power. There was this guy um, at Mahan who wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History in 1890, and the conclusion here is that great nations must have great navies. And, of course, we go into Hawaii in 1898, and what we're looking for there chiefly is the Pearl Harbor Naval Base. If you control Hawaii, you've got, really, it's kind of the halfway point of any route through the Pacific. So this was largely a strategic rather than an economic acquisition on the part of the United States. 
So keep in mind that what you see here is America projecting its power. All right, during this age of imperialism, we're projecting American power and American influence. But keep in mind, too, that the roots of our foreign intervention are going to be resentment, that there are a lot of people in these countries that are imperialized by the United States that are going to thoroughly resent us, and that's going to take a lot of effort to undo. So that gets us through 5.1, and in the next segment, we are going to specifically talk about the Spanish-American War. See you in a bit.